Okay, so welcome back to part two of our question and answer session. I um, apologize about the technical difficulties and running out of time there. So the last question we ran off on was for Scott, and he was talking about his 2030. Uh, his 2030 Sony PVM models from the early 80s, and he thought most of them were, and there are a bunch from the 80s. They went into the early 90s too. At the time, they were considered one of the very top CRTs in the world, the uh, 2030s. And they're still very, very valuable if you get one and you get it in tune, good condition. Uh, a lot of uh, museums and other places are starting to really want those monitors as opposed to even uh, more modern ones. So, 2030, still a great monitor. Uh, I got Fret Border asked if, he, if I'd ever done any videos on Sony BVMs, and the answer is no. Um, I don't currently have any BVMs in my area, which is the Tennessee area in the United States. We don't have a lot of BVMs come available. I did get one BVM one time, a long time ago, and it was an A-series, and I found out the hard way at the time. There was not very much documentation. This was four or five years ago that the A-series didn't really accept the uh, RGB signal unless you had a BKM68X. So that's another conversation for anybody who knows about the BVM and the BKM68X. But just so you know that, um, that was an experience because I had to try to, tr to get any way I could uh, 240p into that monitor. I did end up getting S-Video into it, but that was the best I could do without the 68X. Uh, so I sold it to a uh, film studio in New York who used it to make documentaries and I'm glad I actually made some money on it and I was glad to get rid of it because it didn't do what I wanted and then I was able to pick up a couple of uh, PVMs after that. Uh, but if I do ever come across a BVM, of course, just like the 2005, I'll keep it and do a lot of video content on it and uh, we'll keep it going. So my friend Charlie Cat Anthony has said, uh, I feel the material that you provide needs to be on DVD format or preserved as the years to come, bro. It's truly solid gold content that few uh, days can offer to the public and maybe even Retrotech publish a repair manual out for Amazon or local bookstores. Yeah, that would be awesome. Uh, thanks, Anthony. I told you, man, that would be great if I could get uh, a way to produce this stuff. It's just um, money and time, most of the things. So. I think that uh, as I can step away from other things and get more involved in RetroTech and also kind of expand on what I want to start talking about with the channel, I'll talk about that more as uh, this channel as this video ends. I want to talk about some other things because we want to start talking about other collectibles and kind of ways to finance your hobbies uh, through this retro technology. But this also is growing in value, um, and so for us to just ignore that or not to try to take a benefit to that um, and look at it from a marketing and a uh, personal gain perspective kind of, it would be kind of foolish. And we want to take advantage of what we can. Uh, that means everybody that's in this community that's, uh, you know, I want to expand on that and um, kind of like look at some of the crazy treasures that I found that were just honestly things that were in my, my family's homes that they didn't want, they thought was junk. They had no idea any of this stuff was worth anything. They just wanted to get rid of it. And I was like, well, I'll take it rather than you throwing it in the dump. And um, it ends up being worth a lot of money. And if you have a way to sell it, so we'll talk about the things like that coming up and maybe like a one weekly session video we'll be putting together. Um, Cybers asks, uh, if you're not sure what the problem is in the CRT, do you do a full capacitor replacement across the board? And how do you know what kind of capacitors to order before removal? Okay, so if there is troubles in a CRT, I get a new CRT just like the uh, one that was done to Sony uh, KV that we did the RGB mod on. I want to always make sure, yeah, go ahead and replace the capacitors if I've got it all the way torn down. Uh, if I'm going to tear it all the way down, if I know there's a for sure issue, then yes, it's good to go ahead and get that done and then go from there. You're usually going to start with a good way to calibrate your monitor and set it up from there. And how do I get, or what kind of capacitors do I know? A lot of times with PVMs and BVMs, you can go and find the specific service manual for whatever monitor you're working on. And there's usually a parts list. You can go down to the parts list and try to see if you can uh, code it out where you can find the deflection board, which will have broken down a picture of it 
And this can't be just like the ad manual. It's got to be the full service manual that will be usually over 100 pages. Uh, but you can find the deflection board and it should list out the components on there and you can order them based on that. Uh, so that's one way. Now the other way is if there's no service manual that does that or doesn't have that broken down, it's like with the TV, I actually took it apart. I went through and labeled every, or wrote down, documented by hand, every single capacitor on there. And then um, went to Mouser and built an order sheet for that TV. And so now if I ever ran into that, again, I could use it, but there was no specific capacitor kit ready for that. So I ordered all the capacitors from there. They all worked, uh, but that was a tedious job. And that's sometimes what you got to do. Let's keep this rolling. All right, Matthew Palmer, what do you use for sync on the RGB TV mod? So if you go back and watch that video in the early parts of it, I show that you uh, hook that right into the composite input on one of your composite inputs, preferably one you're not going to use. Uh, again, and that way you can put the RGB mode activated and then use that com input that you tapped your composite. You can use the composite as well as the um, ground off there. And you can also get your audio right from those two audio hookups right there for stereo audio. So you take the lines from those behind there, you solder those in, and then you run that to the back of your SCART head and you'll have a uh, perfect setup there for your audio and your, um, your uh, I'm sorry, sync video line. So I was planning on doing still more, another video with that. I just gotta get past a couple things. Um, I do have an announcement coming up that I'll just quickly announce here, but we're, we are going to a trade show in November. That's November 9th, uh, 7th, 8th, and 9th. It's a expo here in Nashville. That's a retro gaming expo. I've got a booth reserved. Um, I'll post more information about that, but please look for more information for that. And if you want to come to the Gaming Expo, it's a great hotel that's new in Nashville. Check it out. Uh, it's a great example of a place to just come hang out, and it'll be cool. Uh, mostly around retro gaming and pinball and uh, arcade stuff. So um, let's keep going. Any chance? Kenny Lauderdale has been asking me a lot about a uh, recapping guide for a 20M2 MDU. So I don't have a 20M2 MDU in, in my shop right now. I do have a 1953 MD, which is the one before that, the model before that. Uh, so I'll be recapping one of those. The first one, again, I'm going to be recapping is a uh, OEV 142, which is just like that 20M2, uh, only it's the 14M2 Sony. It's the same monitor, just has a different faceplate on it. it. Even says Sony when you take the shell off. It's inside, it says Sony. So that's going to be the one I'm going to do first. I don't have a 20M2, so I can't do that one, but you can use the same procedure on any one of these monitors and it'll work, especially tearing it down and recapping it. And um, Albert asked about removing epoxy on neck boards and tubes. So I'm going to do that and then uh, when I tear down that uh, 142 OEV Olympus monitor, uh, you know, Usually if you just peel that stuff with your finger or just like make sure of course your monitor's not got any power in it. Uh, but you can you know do that or just t t slowly take some kind of soft uh, uh, heat source to it and it should come up a little bit, soften up, maybe like a heat gun, but uh, I wouldn't put too much of that on it. Usually if you just work it, it's so old it comes undone. Uh, if, if you have more problems, you might have to cut it. Cutting it's a good idea. Just be careful to do it slow and take your time so you won't damage anything. Ryan Kimball had a question about the color adjustment video recently and on the smaller monitor which had a lot of trouble and was not fixable, at least not without a full replacement of parts. Um, he's asking about the difference between the potentiometers in the front and the inside and the older monitors and I found when I was using it that the potentiometers inside the monitor did a lot more than the ones in the front of the monitor and you kind of had to use both to tune it up. Um, at least in the past, that's been the way too. Uh, again, if you have a monitor that already has the set color uh, temperatures, that's the best place to try to set your color to. Um, and then you can tell, kind of like with that small monitor, there's obviously a hardware issue in there somewhere. Okay, moving on. Anoy Noni, Ano Noni, sorry. Please show how to do geometry on the uh, 2005 calibration video. That will be coming very soon, and uh, look for that in the next couple weeks. I wouldn't imagine too much longer. Uh, Kenny Lauderdale, flush uh, color video. Would flushing the CRT gun 
fixed the issue on the smaller PVM. I've heard it done, but don't know. Uh, so maybe you're just talking about a rejuvenator, and that's highly discouraged against on the CRTs that are Sony Trinitrons. It's just something about the hardware not mi mixing well, and people having to do, it's very tricky, you can burn out the monitor, the whole tube, and so then you'd have a fried tube if you were just trying to rejuvenate it. So I really don't recommend that. I don't even own a rejuvenator, and I've never personally done it. Uh, Jared Griffith says, for the food for thought on the color TV monitor, uh, if the monitor can display white, then the phosphors on the tube are okay. Uh, put up the STMPE bars and compare it to the 2005, adjust the red and blue first, and then the green. It's strange that the green screen looks white. It doesn't sound like it's a potentiometer fix. And that's very right. Yeah, it's definitely not a potentiometer fix. And that's a great way to go through that and test that uh, where you go start. Yeah, you know, that's pretty much the standard is just get it all the way turned down and then go from uh, red to blue to green on the adjustment scale and there's definitely something up with the green so I'm thinking it's probably a component in that green line somewhere has gone bad uh, so I don't have time to really fix that right now but if, if eventually we'll probably get to that uh, Austin then had a follow-up question to the same video about color what happens if you short the green pin on the neck board uh, if you get a pure green, then it must be something your internal, not the tube. That's another good way. I didn't demonstrate that in that video. Maybe that'll come up in another color video because there's a lot to do with color. We can troubleshoot that some more. Uh, if you can short out each individual color and you see the color bright on the you know red, green, blue, you can short that with a wire and uh, to ground and it should show the color if the monitor is working. That shows that you've got a component issue, which I think we do have on that monitor. Uh, the sword, let's see where we are here. Shuffle time. Now I feel much less stressed about buying a PVM. What kind of screwdriver do you use to take apart the shell? Uh, I'm glad you feel better about buying a PVM. You should. If you want to get one, go ahead and get one before it gets extremely hard and, and even more expensive because the last three years people have been laughing, but the price just seems to double each year. So uh, I don't know. I mean, it's not really going double probably again, but it's going to keep going up on the price of the good ones at least. Uh, and I just use a regular Phillips head screwdriver to take apart the shell. I don't recommend unless you're taking apart and cleaning the uh, back specifically or repainting the shell that you, you remove the rivets to get the plastic piece off. That's really just a pain and those rivets, you can remove them. I'll show you in a future video, but I wouldn't do it that way most of the time. Uh, the Sawyer 10702. Hey, great videos, RGB TV mod. So you're talking about the SCART input and that connection type isn't required in northern USA. This is a Canadian UK import. Well, could you please discuss the SCART RGB? So um, he has a component with TV on, and it looks like um, he would want to know about that. I'll make a more detailed version, maybe of that when I get some time, uh, because I do want to go again into that SCART input. SCART was just pretty much European, um, and it's why it's called Euro SCART. But it does allow for the RGB input, which most American TVs never went past uh, S-Video in the day, and then they jumped up to Component, which is a different video format. Still really great. Highly recommend Component. But um, you don't really get a Component signal. Okay. You don't really get a Component signal out of the uh, consoles normally. So... It's a lot cheaper to just get the RGB signal out of your consoles. And um, there's some great resources on that, like Retro RGB has got a great website for how to get each console to hook up to RGB. And then you feed it through and you either turn it into component or you use the RGB input, RGB mod something like a TV. But you wanna use that SCART input because it's a lot cheaper than to get those component, to get those as opposed to somehow getting component out of every system and you're possibly adding lag and trouble etc and more costly somehow okay michael fisher has a couple questions here and he says he's been trying to enter the service menu of his 1354q any tips on doing it and that's still just using uh you know your you, you turn up your menu you get your regular menu up first and then you just hit the gauss and enter at the same time and that'll pull up that service menu so it's on every uh, PVM that has a service menu, it's the same way to do it. They never changed it as far as I've seen how to get into it. If there's no service menu, that means you don't have any sub-menu. Uh, but that's how you get into it. And then he also had a question about the cab restoration back here. 
the MVS cab. It's still going. It's just been really hot here in Tennessee and I'm waiting for it to cool down a little bit before I finish it off. I did a little bit of the woodwork and repair and it's pretty much ready to go to get all finished. It just needs mostly cosmetic stuff on the outside, but there will be more videos to come on that as that progresses. Okay, a couple more questions here. Um, OJ Taylor had a very long question, good question, about factory resets on a monitor. Uh, he's been trying to get a good report back on setting your monitor back to uh, when you get a monitor and you get, say, a service manual for PVM, and it has in it a factory default settings, okay? So you get a monitor and you don't think it looks right, obviously, on something when you turn it on, and the first thing to do is to get in the submenu, and then you see the values in there. There's numerical values for everything. Well, there was a service menu setting originally from the service provider or, you know, the tech, that set up the monitor originally. That service would have been put, put to the service manual value and then your value would have been probably updated over the years as it was used and recalibrated. As far as recommendations for that, um, I kind of thought that maybe if you had something that was way out of whack that if you went and put it back to the uh, regular settings that it was in originally according to the service manual that that might help but honestly it's not um it's not the spec anymore a ctrt can have a lot of things affected over time its use how many how much it was used as well as how well it was maintained and um, actually things like the magnetism of each room as it was moved to different parts of the country or as it was in use uh, that has an effect on a crt over time and so that's why you see, uh, if you buy these from facilities that use them a lot, there were companies that would go out and physically yearly calibrate these for companies, you know, to make sure they were still in a certain spec because they would just go out of uh, overuse, fall out of spec, and then you'd have to go in through the service menu, and that was the way to get them back into spec using that menu. So honestly, if you go back to that service menu, it's probably not going to help. I mean, it could help. At least it gives you a good starting point. But I've not seen where you're just able to go and put in the regular service menu because I actually tried that once and it didn't look good because the monitor, even if you went and recapped it, it's, it's just stuff about the tube's going to change over time. The tube is what's showing that picture. So the tube ultimately is not the same as it was 20 years ago. It's just aged, just like anything. And you can't replace the tube usually with a brand new tube. Nobody makes tubes anymore. So I hope that helps a little bit. Maybe we'll do some more content. That's a cool thing uh, to talk about. And um, so there's a couple more questions here I've got. And um, I got a question about CRT filming that I wanted to get to. And that was, uh, um, there was a great video about that, but you basically have to time your speeds down to get close to that uh, 59. I checked my camera. I think I'm down to 30 frames and not 60. So I'm not filming at 60 because so I was catching a blink on it. You also got to try to have backlight behind the camera. But that's kind of all the time I have today. And uh, before this video runs out like the last one did, I just want to say again, thank you everybody for sticking around. If you're still here and I haven't gotten your questions, please leave it below in a comment and I will make a follow-up video to this, a part three, and I'll have even more questions to answer. Please look for more qu uh, content from Retro Tech. I've really been enjoying making the videos and uh, have a great day.